Thanks, Gail, so much for joining us. And yeah, I want you to meet Henry Coleman, who's been working with us now for several years, who's the youngest member of Local Futures. Mm -hmm. And so we really like the idea of having uh, the activist leader from XR and our young activists from Local Futures mm -hmm. engaging. And, you know, with a big focus on activism. But I think, first of all, it'd be really good to hear if you're happy to spell out what your thinking is right now, you know, you personally and maybe generally XR, what the broader with, thinking is. With regard to the COVID crisis or just, you know, where we general, are now, or? where we are now, you know, COVID has come and the fork in the road that everyone is talking about, we yeah. know we don't want to yeah. go back and, and, well, indeed, we're running a campaign called No Going Back. Mm. Um, we had activists yesterday putting children's shoes outside in, 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 you know, in a social distance way in Trafalgar Square in the UK, um, I guess, to indicate the, 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 the deaths that would come with the climate crisis and are here already and saying this crisis isn't, there's no vaccine for climate change, you know, but it's, obviously it's well i don't know obviously but um viruses are related to biodiversity loss and how we treat our animal cousins i see it as part of the ecological crisis uh yeah. this covid crisis it's not separate it's not a different thing uh when and if we have an antibiotic crisis that will be a tipping point rather than a curve you know and uh, that you can come out the other side and any of these crises are lined up for us um and I remember Molly Scott Cato's professor of green economics saying that changing the economy, it's like we have to change an aeroplane mid-flight into a helicopter, P possibly not the, the best analogy for a green economist, <laughs> but you know, she's a great, great woman. And, um, but it's, you know, the, the, the aeroplanes landed, we could make those changes. We have to, um, so we we do it's it's hard using the word opportunity when people are dying it's not the right word to use but it is a moment to make changes mm. in honor of people who've died actually because they've died because we have got a system that creates crises and doesn't know how to handle them and a system that doesn't know either how to prevent increases in ill health at every level in our animals in ourselves and then a healthcare system that doesn't know how to how to deal with health either, uh, and GDP that increases with ill health. So yeah, again, this is this the is point. Like, yeah. 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 The, we, we have an economic system, I know you know this, we have an economic system whose purpose is to create profit and to drive growth. And if you have those purposes, then you're going to get bad outcomes. You know, the guy who invented GDP said it was a terrible measure and use it as a sole measure at, at, at your peril, which we do. <laughs> um, although, you know, I think that as much as the economic system has to change, it's the crisis is, is, is deeper and I feel the shifts at a deeper level. The crisis is a crisis of separation and a, a cultural crisis, a, a, a culture that is um, about dominating and taking and wounds and narcissism and consumerism. And um, mm. that culture goes back uh, many centuries now, but it's, it's not the only culture that exists on the world. You know, there are other cultures and there have been other cultures. It's a, it's a kind of, it's a mistake or whether it's a mistake or not, even it's a thing that we did that we need to stop doing now. <laughs> well, I, I love think it. Way. Yeah. I, I just love that you said maybe it's a mistake because I find, I think from my point of view, it has been a wrong turn. It got way out of balance, you know, and it was, you know, a culture you know, patriarchal domination mm. and very, very forcefully destructive in the beginning with genocide, slavery and so on. And many people don't want to look at it as a mistake. And perhaps some of them are right, you know, when they say that it's led to or could lead to an almost evolutionary leap in consciousness of this deep, deep appreciation for the earth, you know, for everything that lives. And so perhaps this sort of deviation will make us that much stronger and that much more conscious of the need to protect life and 
Sorry, Henry, what were you going to say? Uh, I was just going to say, um, I think absolutely the underlying cause is something, or perhaps, you know, this economy came, as Helen was saying, came out of that colonizing mindset, which itself was a, a cultural phenomenon that came from a highly kind of separate, separating and, you know, rationalistic versus feeling kind of masculine versus feminine, very dualistic culture and way of seeing the world. Um, and, but then it's the economy that ha into which that philosophy has been embedded and it's the economy that's been the vehicle um, that our society, that continues to propel our society, even though those values are, are changing in such noticeable ways all around yeah. the world. And so that's why in the same way, although the economy might, you know, you can argue as to whether the economy is the root of the problem or not, but um, from our perspective, it's definitely the vehicle to take us back to a, a, a worldview that recognizes our interbeing. So if we can localize our economies, we can yeah. be put back in touch with each other, with nature, yeah. and be responding to those needs and thereby achieve that kind of cultural revolution. Exactly. Well, and I think of holistic theories of change here. I think of this thing in layers. There's the systemic layer that we're speaking to. And it's obviously not just about the economy. It's about democracy and how those two things have been uncoupled and the capture of democracy to an, an economic system mm. at the systemic level and then the sort of culture of white supremacy and patriarchy and separation and then the feeling that we have of being separated our own emotional bodies and then the kind of you know the spiritual or the wholeness issue and not issue but the place where we don't feel whole and we don't mm. feel I mean, I, as a sort of pagan, I, I love this phrase that uh, my friend's friends use as being a body in the body of life, to, to lose that sense. Mm. And I think where it's good to see these layers is that I, I then see, and, and this is how I think of Extinction Rebellion, it wouldn't be necessarily what everybody thinks, but then you get to, it's possible to work at all of those layers. So you can think of your civil disobedience aimed at the systemic but you also need to look at the wounds you're carrying. We are all part of and have been born of, you know, those of in, in, in the Western democracies, this culture mm. and influenced and impacted by it. And it's not our choice. And um, the work that we can do to heal that is the work that helps our social movements to go better because the places where we feel, you know, Hannah Arendt, the political theorist said the power lies in the collective and it's the places where we feel separated from each other and not like we haven't got each other's back, you know, and that we can't rely on each other and trust each other mm. um, that, that affect um, how well social movements function. And I think there is something, at least for me, you know, and again, it's not everybody's process, but to tap into some source energy, you know, to feel that connection. I just went and sat with an oak tree that has meaning to me before mm. this call. And um, yeah, what can we bring? Because being in such a toxic culture, it's hard to mm. be here, right? I, I think it's... we're yeah, we're born, you know, essentially neurotic because we're born of parents who have already suffered huge trauma from that rupture and separation, you know, for many, many generations. Mm. And I think so. I think you know, broadly speaking, it's about bringing in the spiritual, personal growth dimension in and you know, recognizing that there was this divide between sort of activists who seem to be just fighting and, and were angrily rejecting those people who were on the inner path. There was mm -hmm. a, real, sort of, a real antagonism because there was also a sort of spiritual path in the West until fairly recently that thought of the activism as all about anger and you know, unevolved people. But I'm seeing, you know, beautiful examples like you and, and, and also really widespread recognition now that the inner and the outer are completely connected and that we need to work at both levels. And so also from everything I know, you know, one of the appreciations in XR was from so many people who love the methodology. You know, many of the women who came out and joined the movement so appreciated mm. the whole process. And, and I think you know, that was your leadership, you know, that helped to bring that about and was part of the strength of the movement. And I'm hoping that, that, yeah, that that will continue. And from my, you know, from our point of view, I guess, 
what Henry said about the economy, I slightly modified by saying the reason the economy is so centrally important is that it is what's shaping culture worldwide. Yeah. And it is yeah. literally now shaping Gaia, misshaping Gaia. You know, it's become this enormous machine of artificial money created out of thin air, but in the hands of now near trillionaires. Vandana mm-hmm. just bought Bezos, it's, been, it's now slated to be the first trillionaire. Mm-hmm. And that this artificial money backing irresponsible casino speculation with our mortgages, our lives, our jobs. And so it's, it is this humongous force. And that's why focusing on that, that actually means we need to break that into bits. I mean, that's sort of yeah. what we mean by decentralizing and localizing. So mm. cultural values, ecological realities shape the economy. Well, what, I mean, what's interesting is it's breaking itself into bits. Its own rapaciousness means that it's rapacious to itself. So um, very fond of a podcast actually called The Tax Cast. If people don't know it, look it up by the Tax Justice Network. Uh-huh. And one of the things they were fo- pointing out in their le- last Tax Cast are the mechanisms by which this system, let's call it free market fundamentalism, whatever, because, you know, labels affect people's thinking if you say you're if you say it's capitalism you sound anti-capitalist then then people think that you're anti-business or you say all markets are bad you know it just i just don't find it useful to get into ideological sounding things Mm. you know but anyway sorry the 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 point i was trying to make was that it gorges on itself and so um for the last um period these companies have with all of their profits have been paying themselves massive dividends Share buybacks are a way to um, inflate share prices. Um, they use debt leveraging, they need to take up on lots of debts, move debts into tax. There's lots of financial shenanigans here to, to use money to make money. It's not mm. adding value anywhere. So just even on the basics of you know, capitalism that, that people believe it's for, it's not doing that, it's eating itself, right? It's got to that stage where it's eating itself. And so... 25% of the FTSE 100 companies in the UK in the last period have used 100% of their profits um, on, 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 self, um, on, on, on themselves, you know, either bonuses or whatever. What that means is they've not put any reserves to, to one side. And so now they're begging us for a bailout, you know, because they've been taking their own money. And they've been making vast profits and where's it all gone? Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and this is the... Um, the point at which when we called said that we're anti-capitalists, I think it's time to come out as anti-socialists, you know, we're not into socialism for these companies, you know, where everybody gets to buy them out after they've gorged on themselves. But anyway, this is the point, though, is it, it, it's eating itself and it's bringing itself down. Uh, and it's how much we can take hold of that narrative and how much we end up in these small echo chambers. It's mm. hard to get that out into the public consciousness, isn't it? I've got a way we can do it, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to tell us? Well, you have to break the law. Uh-huh. <laughs> you have to break the law. I mean, so one of the things I'm working on at the minute is the concept of money rebellion. Uh-huh. And, um, and, the, and the idea is that we, we say, and it's been quite hard getting the narrative right, you know, because anything that you do that's financial civil disobedience you know, if you say, for example, you don't pay your tax, or people say, oh, well, but the taxes pay for the NHS, well, hang about, you know, there are 32 trillion dollars of taxes, of, of money hidden offshore, you know, this is, like, this is a protest, this is not, and in any case, it's a disobedience, not a, not a tax avoidance or anything, you could use your money, you could give your money directly to organisations that are doing healthcare for people, so we can get the narrative right, but it takes some time yeah. to build it. Anyway, yeah. the point is, um, is to is to do financial civil disobedience to stop paying mortgages to stop paying debts to stop paying taxes to stop paying utility bills uh to take on debts and then or or open bank accounts take a bit of money out and then say i'm not giving you the money back um each one of those are are options that we have and Mm -hmm. I, i think that people are more likely to come on the streets and get arrested than to do that it's a it's a it's a it's a difficulty people have deciding to do that but we've got mechanisms by which we could make it more appealing actually and more li- likely great i wonder whether you know we in in the localization movement we're working with people 
who are essentially creating the localized systems whereby you are able to support the elderly and the infirm in your area. And so in a sense, it is, it, well, not just in a sense, it is a withdrawal from dependence on and from fueling the dominant system. And I'm just wondering whether as a precursor to this, which I think we are going to be calling for a type of civil disobedience at some point. I'm just very worried about building up the numbers so that we are really, really strong enough to say, we are taking the government back. This is, you know, we're gonna be speaking the truth. If you wanna come yeah. and sit with us, you can yeah. be one of us and we're gonna deal with the, you know, at the level of the nation state, but through international collaboration and dialogue too, because in order to stop corporate welfare, we're gonna yeah. need international collaboration, which is why it's so important also that XR and that our efforts too are international. And it's yeah. just, uh, yeah, I, I hope maybe Henry, you could also say more about how the localization movement is actually enabling people to withdraw from supporting the dominant system while deeply connecting in these human scale ways to the land and the, the trees and the water around them and on which they often depend, as well as the people on which they depend. So as they, as they create that, they, they become well, whole again. And, and those are what we refer to as lifeboats, aren't they? So, yeah. Um, those lifeboats of kind of local economic resilience, it's becoming clearer and clearer to people all around the world that, the, that creating those is our most urgent task. Um, mm. In light of COVID, in light of the fires we had here in Australia, you know, the list goes yeah. on and on. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, when we were, we were talking about taxes, um, the other thing that at Local Futures we talk you know, in the same category as taxes are subsidies and regulations. And um, we were talking also about how to kind of deconstruct that system that is drawing us all into dependence, whether it's economic dependence or dependence just for our survival, our very our mm. basic needs, or a kind of psychological addictive dependence. Mm -hmm. um, those, all those mechanisms, those taxes, subsidies and regulations, you can have some great examples of taxes. Um, and then there's you know, our literature has great examples of subsidies as well. You know, these massive subsidies basically making the food from the supermarket cheaper than the food from the farm down the road, massively yeah. cheaper, you know. So, so people are, um, anyone who is trying to forge a, a livelihood in this system is, is being forced to go and buy that food from the supermarket. So uh, shifting those subsidies um, towards supporting and those taxes and regulations towards supporting those local yeah. hubs of economic resilience um, yeah. will mean, if we can ma make that happen, that will mean that the, the local organic fresh food and the local farmer is the most accessible, cheapest and convenient for the majority of the world's population. And, and often much more nature friendly farming as well, right? Oh, I mean, necessarily. You know, it's, necessarily. It's, it's, it's a win, 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 win generally with these exactly. things. But, as you know, you're swimming against a tide. You know, the corporate welfare agenda in the UK is about, it's one measure, it's 93 billion annually that corporations are given. It's not always wrong to subsidize businesses. I mean, there's, there's arguments with, but um, if you want to do something different, you are going against the tide. Now, the, the point mm. about a tax disobedience, as an example, you don't have to not pay all your taxes, but you could say, I'm not paying a portion mm. because you're funding HS2 in the UK, you're funding corporate welfare. Or you could say, yeah, I'm going to take out a loan of £5,000 and I'm going to give it into this economic system instead and I'm not paying you back. Now, mm -hmm. th there are things that people can't imagine us doing, but that's because you can't imagine the strength of a social movement. Mm. And we need to do that imagining. That is the work for us, in my opinion, is to do that imagining. And then you can, as you were saying, Helena, it's about getting the numbers right. So you can use a process called conditional commitment, which essentially means I'll do it if you'll do it. So when we launch Money Rebellion, we're just going to simply be asking, if you think this economic system's killing life on earth, are you interested in a money rebellion? Yes, I am. Great. Wonderful. We'll phone you up. We'll find out your situation. Maybe you're a student in a halls of residence renting, you know, or maybe you're 
um, an older person who paid off your mortgage, whatever, all these different things. Let's find out. Let's find out what you're up for. It's very useful if people are willing to do what you'd call a vanguard action, you know, a, an initial action to raise the idea of civil disobedience in this space. So 100 people who don't pay their taxes and, and make a symbolic gesture of putting the money into a localist agenda a localism mm. agenda or or, or or whatever or give it in solidarity to frontline resistance all these possibilities so, so you can have beautiful visioning done as part of this totally. and it makes it inspire other people to say well yeah I, you know i will i wouldn't pay my mortgage if ten thousand people would join me well mm. then let's then let's build the numbers it's it, it's a simple process actually you use momentum driven organizing you've got to get on the phone but we need people to believe in each other and and i think the thing i would say is that my 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 sort of frustration over the years in building up towards civil disobedience was that whatever agenda i was interested in whether it was tax justice or forms of economic justice the mm. localism agenda the transition movement um education of young people people would often talk about either you create the lifeboats, you create the seeds of the new way, which is a great thing to do. Um, uh, but it is always limited. It's, um, or you, you try and talk about this amazing thing, you know, Polly Higgins ecocide law, this amazing thing, and get more people interested in it. But how things change, you know, how do you see the change? It generally needs civil disobedience. And, and, and that resistance we have to doing that is is because we're all you know baked into this culture and partly sometimes you know sometimes it's not the right thing for individuals because you know you, you might have caring pressures on you or uh, economic pressures that you you know mental health pressures i mean it's not to say everybody should do do this but being in support of civil disobedience is not only because it's an effective mechanism and you can see that with extinction rebellion what what impact we've had it's also very initiatory is the thing I like to tell people that place when you go, I'm not doing this anymore. Why, why would I give my money to this system mm. when I could give it to this, which is life affirming. I think you that know, it makes initiation. Yeah. <laughs> makes Sorry. so much sense to, uh, to do that locally as well. So if you're, um, if you have a, a local hub of tax disobedience, um, yeah. that can then fund something that really creates visible impacts, both ecologically as well as economically, socially, and, and um, psychologically even for the people in that, in that community. All exactly. these people could come together. Um, this is the, this is the umbrella, isn't mm. it? I mean, yeah. I mean, we also, we, we say, you know, some people can't, think about making the end of the month uh, rather than think about the end of the world you know i mean some people exactly. just can't pay so as much as there have been sort of government schemes to try and help people through this crisis to some extent and they, they, they've been whatever i don't get, get into that but they're, they're often running at about 80 percent of what people would normally be in receipt of and people don't have a 20 percent slack in their system it's often paying off debts Right. I mean, so um, I, I don't see anything other than a, a, a massive depression uh, being around us out the outside of this crisis. And then as you were talking about subsidies, I mean, the figure from the IMF, I believe, is that fossil fuels are subsidized at $10 million a, a minute mm. through, through the allowance of externalities as well as the money that goes to them. OK, so $10 million a minute. Right. Mm. It's super crazy. And that's part of what Henry was talking about. This is how it ends up that food that comes from the other side of the world and in the big supermarkets is cheaper than food from the farm down the road. So all the prices in our economy are affected by these hidden yeah. subsidies. And then I think a key thing we need to keep coming back to is that if we can make sure that the movement, both in terms of what we call resistance and renewal, both sides, yeah. Yeah. And the renewal is about creating those localized systems, the more human scale connection and building the, the new economy. Uh, if we can always try to remember to talk both about the livelihoods of people, the stress mm. and, the, and the insecurity in their, in their livelihoods and how to survive, as well as the fear and insecurity we now feel because of climate change and the environment. If we can link those, I think for them, we'll have such a strong movement. Because I, exactly. we're talking about, yeah. you know, almost every single person is yeah. either super conscious of their economic insecurity, 
or of this environmental crisis. And, you know, more and more people are aware of both because, you know, we're talking about a depression that actually over the last 30 years in most countries, as GDP has been going up in every country, the gap between rich and poor has been rising to this obscene level, obscene, even in yeah. Scandinavia, you know, and so we're, we're talking about even the supposedly, you know, well off upper middle classes or whatever, still in debt, still struggling, you know, and if there's a bit of a hitch, you know, living in fear and anxiety. So we, you know, we, we really are talking about a system that, that is uh, clearly creating this fear and insecurity. Marginalizes the majority, yeah. 99% yeah. of the yeah. population. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's interesting, I'm sure you saw this book by uh, Wilson and Pickett from quite, uh, probably 10 years ago now, um, The Spirit Level which was looking at the impact on income inequality on many, many different indicators, including the, the ability to think about climate change as an issue. There's, um, it's highly correlated. Any kind of social issue is highly correlated with income inequality and it affects everybody. So it affects people who are also wealthy. But I think because we're just not meant to live like that psychologically in this kind of, you know, I mean, I think any, community might have somebody with a bit more wealth and that you tend to have these you know with the gift economy you have these moments of redistribution don't you but um and it's seen as um it's culturally held you know i mean we have this culture that has attacked um tax using language like tax relief like you're supposed to be relieved of you know it's almost like saying you know parent relief i'm just going to relieve myself of being a parent i mean i need a break from your kids or whatever but you know it, 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 it you're there to serve and it's a duty and it's a contribution to society isn't it and that's the um the other piece when i i think when environmentalists talk about economics they tend to talk about subsidies of fossil fuel and about money being invested in the wrong thing and i think um it's less understood the depth of the corruption of this system mm. of the financialization uh, whereby you know as i think as charles eisenstein says that that, that um, nature gets turned into products and communities and relationships get turned yeah, into time. services yeah. you know it's um it, 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 and, and 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 every stage somebody's trying to eke out some some profit from that as we all get fragmented uh well you know the big shift right now is that um our key workers, our nurses, our carers, you know, have been recognized for they are the foundation stones of the economy. And I just was talking to two nurses that were actually having a little picnic last night. They were saying, oh, we're not getting a pay rise, though. You know, their pay has been frozen and lives have been on the line. Mm. They've seen horrendous things. Uh, and yeah, I, it just to make that connection between how this system treats people and how it treats the environment it's 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 just clearly across the board it's not good for anybody yeah that's so fundamental now to i i believe that we are on the verge of this breakthrough that people are going to say enough is enough there's something fundamentally wrong and i think if we can articulate clearly how it's the economic system that's driving this insecurity and and driving, you know, poverty is trickling upwards. Wealth is not trickling downwards. It's the opposite. And so we're talking about bigger and bigger numbers of people who have every reason in the world to say enough is enough. We want to support this new system, yeah. this new economy. Mm. Um, and if I can just bring in the psychological dimension there, which I think is the other major elephant in the room, if you've got ecology, economy, and psychology. Um, mm -hmm we are seeing mental health crises in every country that we know of worldwide, um, particularly in young people, but not only in young people. And then if, if we can connect the, that epidemic um, to the economic system that is stressing people out, that's breaking down and, as you say, commodifying our relationships with other people, that's taking us away from the natural world, that's making us feel that we don't have um, any say over what goes on in our lives or what our future looks like. I mean, all of those um, fundamental actions of the economic system on our, on our individual 
on our inner selves are so are just intensifying and um so if we can make the argument for a systemic shift in direction from that standpoint too i mean there's like three doors into this paradigm shift that you know everyone yeah. Is, yeah. needs to needs to I mean, enter listen let's not make the argument let's do it this is the thing <laughs> right so i mean the, the 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 intergenerational injustice is i i don't I, I i can't find the words for it i mean we've we've had this injustice between the neocolonialism uh how, how we treat other countries the racism that that requires mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's and, and, and that that has happened has now come home is the way I say it into an intergenerational injustice where young people that there is no job security there's no pension there's no future there's no um, getting on the housing ladder and so what you know on the on the whole and there's there's this you, you know you're indebted um, in, in in terms of getting education you're in massive debts in terms of accommodation and then this carbon debt you're supposed to figure out sucking the carbon out of the atmosphere ignoring climate tipping point science you know yeah. it's, it's just an unbelievable outrage now what would young people do if, in the face of that and, and and the extracting of young people into the system of narcissism and you know instagram pictures and all that yeah. nonsense you know like the resistant be, be, be in resistance to it in a beautiful way and in service to the future and take out loans from the system and not pay them back like enrique from uh, you know spain who just took out hundreds of thousands and gave it away to activists i mean the models are there but the, the point is to do it as a collective if young people yeah. get organized you don't have to have this system and so it's not simply making the case for alternatives that's important because you you know you need to know that there are so many you know you've got kate roweth with her donor economics helena with localism uh bioregional economics from molly scott cato post capitalism from paul mason you've got regenerative capitalism that some people talk about pro, um, prosperity without growth economic you know it's there's like a loads of fantastic ideas if you want to do it let's just do it you know this is the thing is is for young people to get organized and i think that's the way to um deal with uh, mental health issues more than anything is to get together i mean and this is what, what you know we're talking about the layers at the start is the is is the um the place where young people are, are separating you talk to young environmentalists and like you know i was a young environmentalist in my teens as well and you you often feel like a bit of a lone geek or whatever separated from other young people find each other because you, you you exist you know there are there are other people in other countries and around the corner down the street you know find each other and get organized is 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 the piece totally. if you you know and and get off any social media that's driving your head you know they just don't look at it i mean hopefully there's good stuff there as well but um, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know what i'm saying i mean it's, it's, social media has got its uses like it's yeah. going to be a great way to get things organized i'm not saying but i'm just saying no um, exactly but it has this addictive element which so many yeah people i mean i know for myself i'm 23 and um so I was being socialized by the iPhone, the, uh, the screen, like the handheld socially interactive screen from like age 15. But now it's like age four. I mean, I, I, and I can see how that's affected my own social and psychological kind of development in very significant ways. Um, and that now that it's so much younger, I mean, I think, I think there's not enough conversation about how serious that is. Then it's it's like an elephant in the room that's going to blow. I mean, I I wouldn't want to put this, wouldn't want to put this bit in our world localization day because it can seem so depressing. But um. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think I think Gail and I would both agree, even though Gail is much younger than I am. But I feel sort of I feel. I want to say we're running out of time and let this crisis now be the crisis that really yeah. wakes us up and where we really commit to change. Yeah, but I yeah. guess partly what I wanted to explain to you, Gail, is that my conviction is that for people to connect 
we, we are convinced that precisely we need that deeper connection, that reliable connection that the mm. social media can't provide. And so we're mm. very much about urging people to, as one of the first steps, change the I to a we, connect mm. with a group. It might just be two or three, but try to find either in the workplace or neighborhood, it may not be family, it may not be neighbors, but find some like-minded souls and create a little hub, create a little group. And yeah. from that space of changing the I to a we, you also start actually enjoying the planning for action and the, you know, the doing. It's, it's a deeply, deeply, uh, you know, I, I mean, I would, <laughs> I would argue along with a lot of other people that we evolved connected and that one of the fundamental ways that this economic system has succeeded in creating the fear and the competition and the ruthlessness is by dividing us. Mm. And mm. once we actually come together and we hear, we're seen, we're heard, we don't dream of being, you know, one of those stars that billions of people are watching. We suddenly mm. feel heard and seen. And yes, we're worth something. We're ordinary. Nobody's perfect. Yeah. So it's yeah. a real life connection where people yeah. can feel, become human again. So yeah. for us, yeah. that's why we talk about the local because we, we really believe that that connection needs to be place-based. And then we also are seeing that as people start taking action to build the local economy, particularly around food, it's absolutely essential. This is only mm. through shorter distances that you can start stimulating diversification and respect mm. for biodiversity, including that you don't need in the local market every apple and banana to be the same size and to fit the machinery and to fit the supermarket shop. Mm. So you suddenly... Yeah, it's just a win-win-win. Mm. Then we're saying that's not enough. We've got to change the dominant system. And mm. so we tend to refer to that as the resistance and the renewal. And we're saying, maybe you wouldn't agree with that. Um, you know, we're saying that in order for that resistance to be truly transformative, we've got to build up the numbers. Don't bother going off and lobbying in your central government, you know, in London or in, in Washington, D.C., because you're, it's deaf ears. Please, let's talk to one another. Let's talk to the peace movement yeah. and the women's movement and the yeah, people yeah. concerned with poverty, the people concerned with depression, the people concerned with climate change. Let's come together yeah. and, and, then, and then demand. My strategy would be finding a way for that disobedience and that demonstration to happen in every neighborhood, in every town in the country. So well, I mean, there's data, there's data on this. There's data, I mean, yeah. just to speak to a few of the things you said. I mean, one of the things yeah. I've really enjoyed about the, the crisis actually with the so-called social distancing, I really do think we should call it physical, physical distancing. Physical yes, exactly. Yeah, come on, you know, the social <laughs> creatures. But um, is when, when you do that little, you're walking down the street and you, past somebody and you you do that kind of awkward <laughs> oh we've got to do this thing there's a greater connection yes. i really yeah. enjoy that really? kind of like <laughs> scene of each other like oh we're in this time and space yeah. together mm. and this odd thing's happening and it's made it's made of, of anyway and, and 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 then speaking to this the economic impact on, on psychology you know mrs thatcher said that economics are the method the object is to change the heart and soul you know, economics are the method, the object is to change the heart and soul. And that's what they did. And she said there was no such thing as society. Society, exactly. Boris has come out and said, clearly there is, you know, when we're out mm. on the streets clapping. And um, in terms of numbers, I mean, I think it's, on the one hand, yes, let's come together. And there have been and there are ways in which there's different theories of change on the left and groups have problems with each other and then somebody's got this hashtag and that it, 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 it's uh, you know we have we, we work within a movement of movements in in extinction rebellion we definitely talk to other groups and it's finding common ground and i think um it's not it's not easy uh and um it, it doesn't need to hold you back from action so you you may be aware of the, the the research that erica chenoweth and maria stefan did on significant moments of of change um overthrowing dictatorships and so on they happened when up to 3.4 percent of the population rose up and they were more stable and more effective if they were non-violent and 
so the civil rights movement at its height was one percent of the population so the, the, it, it's as much as yeah you want numbers there, there is also the demonstrator effect of somebody going ahead and doing something that inspires other people mm. it sort of normalizes it so I think it's there's mm. a bell curve here isn't there yeah. you know that yeah. the, the, even the marketeers use you know yeah. innovators early adopters and all the rest of it and I think there's no, it's no different in um in civil disobedience um and as i say you know th what what can be interesting with the money rebellion is the conditional commitment and the story that that can create in itself i, I, yeah, love that. I, yeah. I will do that if other people yeah. join me yes. so oh we've now already got five thousand people who've got you know let's say a, a, a mortgage with barclays bank let's talk about Marcus bank you know mm. and um so d d just the building up of threats and we don't need to wait to be back on the streets to do that have you heard of simultaneous policy? Do you know yeah, that book? Simple, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That again. John Bunce, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that's so just, I, I don't, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so one of the things that we um, are calling for with Money Rebellion is a global citizens' assemblies to look at how the economic system needs rewiring. And um, I, I think that Simple is something that you could bake into that process. I mean, it's the way Extinction Rebellion works is not to say what the changes need to be because it's our job to open up the space where people can say well you know if you want to capture carbon regenerative agriculture is a great idea or um, the vast majority of people need to fly very little or whatever it's up to people to talk about you know we say we want people to make the decisions about what happens it's not for xr to tell everybody um which economic system or what changes need to happen mm -hmm. because you can point to some of them it's like examples and so on um, but yeah, some, so, I, so th that's an obvious piece, isn't it? Simple. I, I think that's where um, XR and World Localization Day go so well hand in hand because your demand of global citizens assembly requires people being aware of another path forward, one that is not sp spoken about by it really either left or right in a, in a genuine way at this point. It requires a kind of groundswell of awareness about this other path um, that is towards both ecological you know genuine regenerative agriculture and genuine genuinely sustainable um, communities and towards um, real human well-being and prosperity so it, it's kind of you know if we're on the awareness raising side of the, the equation um, to your kind of demand for the, the global citizens assembly I, I see that as a nice dovetail and we can have them locally as well local people's assemblies local citizens assemblies mm. i mean just um by way of background i used to be a director of transition stroud a volunteer director and we have like uh, the uk's best farmers market mm -hmm. which is um we've got an online shop called stroud co for where you can you know my friend opened a plastic free shop we used to buy that stuff in the shop or through Stroud Co. We've got community supported agriculture. It's it's like a real little paradise actually. Mm. And mm. it was um I think it's in the top three of nice towns to live in Stroud where I live. As a result, you know, I mean it's you go to the farmers market and you know you just I mean actually you never go to the farmers market in a hurry because you're just gonna bump into loads of people that you know it's a real joy. Um the be being in a a local economy uh, and we did also try having a local currency and it didn't work so well you learn things from that you know i mean there's um uh you are swimming against the tide aren't you uh with, mm. with, with, with these things and like the farmer's market cheese might seem more expensive than the you know uh, antibiotic laden one it's, and well, we, exactly we know, and that's why we need that resistance and renewal so that exactly so that we can change you know, turn that equation on its head and actually it's the farmer's market cheese that uh, is the most accessible and becomes the most accessible and the cheapest for the majority and, of the population. And, you know, the, the logic of an unmanipulated economy is that everywhere in the world, something that's been transported for a kilometer will be cheaper than something that's been transported for 10,000 kilometers. Yeah, so that's, yeah. you know, it's highly manipulated, the dominant system. I, 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 I was laughing before I came on with my boyfriend about doing this because I, um, I often use beer as the example. I, I think I've got, I used to do this thing called street school economics and maybe it might have been beer I used as the example actually where, oh yeah, in 2004, the UK imported three 
110 million pounds worth of beer and exported 313 million pounds worth of beer um the thing is i really love belgian beer <laughs> <laughs> i was thinking what we're, saying, what we're saying is that you would need to pay a bit more for that but there's no reason why you shouldn't have it but you know we have got a fantastic paying, local brewery yeah, Stroud brewery yeah. by the way they're awesome if you too. were paying more for it you know, you would find that there would be far less transporting costs because if you did have delicious local beer, then you would prefer to have that more reasonable. And the amazing thing is that already now, you know, is that somehow we've managed to get local food initiatives off the ground inside a system that's so heavily subsidizing and supporting this corporate welfare. Somehow it's happened, you know, and we started local currencies as well, you know, sort of 20 years ago, two of them in America. And basically we've seen all around the world, the local currencies are not working, but local food is. And that's why for us, it's so important to try to encourage that we continue to move in that direction. Because it's quite a miracle that it's yeah. able to take off in this climate of all these hidden subsidies. And mm. not just that, but over-regulating the local while the global are being deregulated. That's what the free trade is all about, is giving yeah. Monsanto and Coca-Cola more freedom while the average farmer, the average shopkeeper is suffering from often far too heavy-handed regulation. So it's, yeah, yeah. but anyway, I, I, I know you have to go very soon, don't you? You probably have to go now, more or less. Is there anything, anything that you would like to say to the, before we go? Um, just a happy localism day. Obviously, we want localism paradigm shift. Um, we want localism every day. But thank you for the work that you're both doing. Um, it's it's have it, holding that rational, inspiring vision of the future is 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 what we're fighting for. You know, um, and yeah, thank you. Just mm. grateful. It was a joy to chat to you both. I'd, I'd love to say thank thanks you. to you too as well for your amazing work and. Um, yeah, I just find your um, heartfelt passion for these issues so infectious. Um, yeah, and I, I'm humbled because I'm of that generation who you are speaking to so much. Um, so, yeah, I'm honoured to be speaking with you for that reason as well. Um, I think, I think um, we were getting at, at it towards the end of that conversation, the power of regeneration. And, like, it's almost like, we've seen it with local food blossoming in a system that's, you know, trying to clamp it down. Um, we're seeing it um, around the world in ecosystems where people are rewilding and agri-wilding, as mm. Helena loves that, agri-wilding, mm. um, you know, erupting the, the well-being and the diversity of life, restoring so much more quickly than we probably dare to imagine. And I think the same is true for the psychological impacts. And if, you know, if we have, um, socializing a generation through the screen right now then that the way that they could be healed through through those community initiatives and through being put back into real human connection with one another and with the mm. land I, I feel like we can still be really optimistic that there'll be massive healing that we we don't really dare to believe and I think that's what mm. keeps me going as a young person as well that's the other thing though you know the to me the localist piece of music local music you know just hanging out who needs to go anywhere when you've got you know we sort of think of it as quite worthy things don't we like food and currencies and yeah. all the rest of it but you know just hanging out with a guitar yeah. together yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely that's at the core of it and there yeah. must be yeah Mm. And, and you, you know, you're again so young, but I remember so well when that was, you know, that was the culture, hanging out with the guitar. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's coming back again, isn't it? I've, that's another great bit of news we had, but that's happening across the world now in the pandemic. Much right. more of that, like whole neighborhoods coming out. Like in, Joanna Macy the other day was telling me in Berkeley, people are out on the street corner every Tuesday they're out there playing their music together you know mm -hmm. in Italy they were singing across. Cool. yeah 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 anyway lots of love Gail lots, lots of, of love, love to you both have a great day <laughs>